currently working with the Enbridge uh, rebate for the home efficiency rebate, as well as Natural Resources Canada for the Greener Homes Grant, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, as you know, or you may know, in 2015, 196 countries signed a legally binding international treaty on climate change and committed to net zero emissions by the year 2050. Net zero uh, energy means that we produce as much energy as we use. For example, in the home, if you had a net zero home, that would mean that you would generate electricity at the same rate that you are using it. And so here you can see the building emissions for the GTHA. About 44.6% of emissions come from the building sector, which is the biggest chunk. Um, these emissions, having said that, these emissions do not count for the embodied emissions, which is something to keep in mind. Um, and since then, Hamilton has developed a community energy and emissions plan to show a path forward towards net zero emissions by 2050. The plan addresses all citywide energy use from home to transportation, buildings, waste, and more. So uh, while we're all here today, our solar panel webinar, um, thank you again for attending. For the newcomers that have just joined us, this meeting is being recorded. Um, and our speaker today is Ruth Cooper. So Ruth Cooper has a Bachelor of Engineering degree from the University of Carleton. Her career began as a mechanical engineer in the automotive industry and has worked in the industry for about 12 years, including working with uh, industry leading Fortune 500 automotive manufacturers. Realizing her passion was for sustainability and existing buildings more so than vehicles, she completed a master's degree in applied science within the Department of Civil engineering at McMaster University. Over the last 15 years, Ruth has uh, been supporting the renewable energy industry uh, and building, science, uh, building sciences sector through provisioning of such services and, and as energy audits, site assessments, renewable energy project development, system design, and performance simulation, including hands-on involvement in solar PV and thermal system installation. Steeltown Solar, which is Ruth's uh, company, was founded in 2010 as a division of Ecodomus Consulting to support solar PV projects under the feed-in tariff program. So I will turn it over to Ruth now, and I will also be monitoring the chat for any questions that come up. Uh, we will address those at the end, but if there are any relevant questions, I'll be sure to interrupt Ruth and, uh, and pose those questions if that's okay with you. Um, so without further ado, here is Ruth Cooper, um, and we will be walking you through our presentation today, starting with the headline. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm so glad you came out to enjoy this wonderful evening, even though you know the sun is setting, but we are going to talk about the sun. Thank you so much, Moises, for the introduction and giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge about residential home solar installations and the, the process through which we need to go to assess the site and come up with the permits and the designs and do the installation work. So what I'm hoping to cover and I'm going to have to be quite quick. It turns out I have quite a bit of material, but we're hoping to essentially show you what this looks like in a residential home, just to show you what we're gearing towards. Basically talk about a little bit energy conservation, efficiency, consumption, and generation, because the conservation is worth at least five-fold of generation, and we need to start from a good place before we consider generating more. A little bit of solar photovoltaics 101 for those who kind of have seen the panels but kind of wonder what's going on behind the scenes. A typical solar PV system as would be installed on a residential home's roof. And then for at least here in Hamilton, Ontario at this time, the permitting design and installation process. And then going forward, what would this look like from a system operation and maintenance? And then hopefully answer any questions that might come up. So here's our case study. And we are lucky here at Green Venture to have a wonderful pioneer in the form of Heather, who has installed a fairly substantial system on her home. So to put things in perspective, this is the largest system that can actually be put on a residential home without requiring um, additional permitting with the utility company. So this is as big as it gets. And the thing to bear in mind is 
kind of a combination of where the house is, how big it is, to take a look at estimating what you might be able to fit on your own home. So Heather's home is about 1,600 square feet just based on the roof surface area. It makes most sense to focus your solar installation onto the south facing side of the roof. Your home could be oriented differently, which makes south not really what you've got, but west and east with a slight south bend to them are equally useful from a solar insulation capacity. And so in this particular case, we have 800 square feet. What was able to be fit on there was 26 solar panels. So for your own home, once you see the square feet, take a look at estimating about 14 watts per square foot. And then you can estimate how big a system might fit on your house. For Heather's house, it was 11.7 kilowatts. And that system in Ontario here, considering a roof that is south facing and at an optimal tilt, which is usually degrees latitude, what we've got is about 1,125 kilowatt hours per month. And this is on average. So if you look at your utility bill, you'll see how much you are consuming on average per month or month over month. But this is a good starting point. And from there, you can almost do the reverse math to see what size of system you would need to offset your own consumption. So the cost estimate at this point is running at about $2.50 to $2.75 per watt. So for Heather's ginormous system, we're looking at 30,000 for the installed cost, which depending on the installation company that she's using would also include the permitting fees which are not a large amount. So plus or minus about 500 to 750 for permitting, which we'll get into later in the presentation. From a warranty and from, from a warranty perspective, the solar panels themselves, from a manufacturing defect, does the frame stay together? Does it stay glued? Uh, is 12 years. From a performance perspective, just to show you, these things are virtually indestructible. The manufacturer states that after 10 years, you can expect minimum of 90% of the rated performance to still be coming out of them and 80% or more after 25 years. So these panels will last at least, if not more, um, as long as your roof does, When you, especially with the asphalt shingled roofs. So what's really recommended is to get a much more durable roofing system. Uh, the inverters, at this point in time, about 12 to 15 years is what the manufacturers are warranting their performance for. So that's what it looks like. Before you even consider doing your own generation of electricity, take a close look at your own lifestyle choices and think about conservation efficiency, look at Energy Star compliant devices, look at the hours of the day that you're operating. Many of you have already started doing this because of time of use and other such billing incentives from the utility company. But just to put things in perspective, you've got a hair dryer that's 1,875 watts. So 10 minutes of drying your hair is 300 watt hours, which is like three hours of 100 watt light bulb. And similarly, your dryer is running at around 4,000, somewhere between 1,800 and 5,000 watts. So these are huge appliances that draw a lot of electricity. And especially during the summer months, we may want to kind of reconsider things like the clothesline. So with solar, the key things to consider is conservation and efficiency, efficient appliances, time of day and month of the year. As you can imagine, the sun likes to shine during the day and it also is more prevalent in the summer months. So just to put things in perspective, here's what Canada looks like. In southwestern Ontario, we have a really good solar potential here. The only place that would be better is if you were to move into this, the southern regions of Saskatchewan. Regina is the solar hotspot. And then those of you who might have been around when the feed-in tariff program was here, which came out of Germany, this is what Europe looks like. And the color coding is a little bit different than the map that we just saw. And on their map, for a similar 1100 to 1200 solar kilowatt hours per kilowatt, what we've got in Germany is the same, if not a little bit less than what we have in Canada. So Canada is definitely a place where solar energy is completely viable and something we should be doing. 
So people might ask, you know, what is solar? Like, what, what are, what's happening here? Because there's no moving parts and people might want to know what's going on. So essentially what we've got is a semiconductor sandwich where one side has more electrons than the other side. And the layer in between forms what's called an electric field at the junction, otherwise known as a depletion zone that essentially prevents current from running through. When the energy from the sun becomes strong enough, the electrons in the more negatively charged outer layer are encouraged to try to leave. And because they can't go through the junction at the depletion zone, what they're forced to do is follow the conduits that join all the solar cells together to the junction box and out through the leads. So I like to describe this system as a kind of solar powered battery. So when the sun isn't shining and there isn't energy impinging onto the solar cells, there is no charge differential and nothing's happening. As soon as the sun has enough energy breaking the bonds, setting these electrons free, you've got a voltage differential like you would with a battery. And as soon as you put a load on that, you've got a current. So from the solar cell, what we create are what are called solar modules. So typically you string 62 or 70 of these cells together. A uh, thing to bear in mind with solar panels is the ones where you see these hexagonal shaped uh, cells, these are called monocrystalline because these cells are actually individually sliced. They're thin slices from an ignit, which is like something that's about the size and shape of a zucchini. Well, actually the size and shape of the solar cell. And these thin slices are what make up those hex shaped cells that you see making up a monocrystalline panel. The leftover bits and pieces can be melted down and poured into thinner sheets and they make up your polycrystalline solar panels, which are just slightly in a, less efficient because the, the, I guess at the microstructure level, they don't align as well as they do with the grown monocrystalline. And so what this really means is panels of the same size that are polycrystalline will generate slightly 4% roughly less electricity than the monocrystalline panel. Another new product on the market are the bifacials, which essentially allow for reflected energy on the, to impinge on the backside, creating a little bit more energy depending on where these panels are installed. So it's very much a custom choice. So you go from the solar cell to the solar module. When you group the modules together, what you have is a panel. So on Heather's house, we've got a panel on the main roof and then two smaller panels on the door, on the uh, ridged piece that sticks out. And once you have the entire system, it's typically referred to as an array. All right, so solar panels, solar modules in general, they come in various sizes and shapes for your, from your RV to your boat. You've seen the small 12 volt, 24 volt. You see them on the sides of the road um, at construction sites, turning on lights and signs. They've been around and will now look to you to become ubiquitous. As I've pointed out where they are, you will see them. The ones that go on uh, people's houses are typically about three and a half to five feet, sorry, three and a half by five and a half to six and a half feet in size, these large rectangles. And the small panels uh, are 10 watts and up to about 500 watts. The ones on Heather's house were 450 watt panels. As I mentioned before, the cool thing about these solar powered batteries is they hook together very much like batteries do. So if you put them in series, the voltage is additive. If you put them in parallel, the current is additive. And this is what allows for the modules to be strung together into larger panels and arrays, which can then be used to either feed directly into the grid or to charge battery bank. So here we have sort of how solar is being used on rooftops, ranging from arrays of solar panels and modules to solar shingles, to whole roof solar systems. Currently in the market, what's more prevalent are the arrays of solar panels. The shingles, given that they are relatively new to the market and the industry, the technology has them in at being slightly less efficient. And some of these products are not as prevalent in the market. So how does this affect you? What do you need to consider? In general, what we need to look at is the shading situation on your home, on the roof of your home. Uh, you really want no hard shading from other buildings or heavy shade trees between the core hours of 10 and two. 
Uh, this is predominantly something you would look at for the south facing roof, but also, as I mentioned, east and west is good. Um, you can put solar panels on the north facing side of your roof, but the performance makes it such that it, it doesn't really make sense from a cost effective perspective. Uh, dust and debris is not really a huge issue unless you're out in the rural areas where there's a lot of agriculture and there's wheat, chaff and things like this in the air. For the most part, I found that rain and wind um, are enough to keep the systems relatively clean. If you've got ground mounted considerations, you need to look at level terrain so you're not putting twisting loads on your panels and your racking. And then your foundation will depend on whether or not the ground is stony or swampy or, or standard kind of dirt loam garden material. Most important for your roof is that your the condition of your roof should be such that you don't need to do any re-roofing for at least 15 years. So the age of your shingles shouldn't be any more than 10 years old. Ideally, this would be something that you would consider right after re-roofing. Also, if you are in a position where you're considering installing solar shingles, solar shingles, solar panels, um, you would want to also perhaps consider installing a more durable roof so that you don't have to worry about uninstalling the entire system to re-shingle in the 15 or less years that are now kind of standard for some of these shingles. And for those who are concerned about rafters and truss systems, on most homes, I haven't run into anywhere this has become an issue. The racking manufacturers have engineered stamp drawings that accommodate the loads. They've been working with the solar module manufacturers to ensure appropriate load distribution for our roof, given our building code standards. So what does this look like on your home? Essentially, you've got your solar panels on the roof. You have an inverter that takes the direct current from your solar panels and converts it to alternating current. This then connects directly to your main panel, typically in your basement, which then goes to the meter, which connects to the grid. And what the utility company can do with this is they see how much you consume versus how much you're generating, and you are then billed for the difference. So the main system components, we've got solar modules, we've got the inverters, which are doing the conversion from direct current, which is what solar panels generate, to alternating current, which is what most of our appliances are consuming. And the thing to bear in mind with inverters is there are different sizes, and there are ones for the grid, for off-grid, for hybrid. And the um, interesting other consideration is the pure versus modified sine wave. Uh, this is something to consider if you have sensitive electronic devices. Uh, you should ensure that you've got a pure sine wave inverter. The um, balance of system components include things like combiner boxes, disconnects, breakers, and fuses, and the cabling and connectors to string everything together. Uh, the panel mounting system, obviously, and then optionally, there are batteries, charge controllers, and power conditioners. So a little bit more on mounting systems. The mounting system can have quite a bit of effect on the generation of electricity. For the fixed roof systems that we're looking at, you're typically stuck with the pitch of your roof. Um, and therefore, the railing system will take advantage of whatever that slope is. Uh, if you have a flat roof, though, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can have a fixed tilt or you can have a seasonal adjustment tilt. With pole mounted systems, you have even more flexibility. And op, um, optimally, what you really want is what's called a dual axis tracking system, because what produces the most electricity is if your solar panel throughout the entire day um, is positioned in such a way that it is perpendicular to the rays of the sun. So the dual axis tracking, you've probably seen these out in the field mounted on poles. Sometimes they'll look like a table. What they do is they turn upright as the sun rises, and then they follow the sun from east to west to maintain this optimal position. Just a quick word on batteries. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but essentially you've got, you know, from your water with the distilled water, old maintenance level batteries, all the way through to the latest in lithium, uh, big cost variation, but also huge life cycle difference, three to five years for your flooded lead acid, up to 10 years plus for your lithium, and also the depth of draw of, of discharge. The lithium, you can pull up to 80% of the rated capacity of the battery. 
Whereas most of the other units, if you pull any more than 50%, you adversely affect their life. So that's something to bear in mind. And of course the costs will uh, vary accordingly. So the main configurations that we're going to see, the top row here is showing you what the grid uh, connected net metered system will look like. You've got your solar panels, you've got your inverter, switching you over to alternating current, going to your main breaker panel and, the, and which then feeds to the meter, which then connects to the grid. The other option, which is sometimes an auxiliary system that's added on, is to have an auxiliary electrical panel, which will allow you to put things like sump pumps, maybe your freezer, a couple of circuits, so that when there is no electricity, you still have the solar panels and um, charge controller maintaining a battery bank, which will allow you to operate while everybody else is, is not operating. <laughs> is off the grid. So this is kind of like a little off-grid system for you when, when the power on the grid is not available. So just to put that in perspective and for clarity, when you're in the net metered configuration, what happens is you will not be able to have electricity when the grid is down. This is very important. Uh, it is for the safety of the linesman what happens is the they're called grid safe inverters and the inverter what it does is it senses whether or not there is grid voltage and if it does not see any voltage on the grid it doesn't actually operate so even though you have solar panels on your roof your friends might think oh look at you you're off grid living you're not um, the only way you are is if you choose to have an auxiliary panel a transfer switch batteries and a charge controller which is the next slide Things. So this is the auxiliary additional system that will allow you to have power when the grid is down. The one other thing that I wanted to mention about the net metering is you really need to size your system based on your consumption. Because if you're over consuming, sorry, if you're over producing, you have a 10, a 12 month window during which to use this excess um, production or else it's basically going out there for free for the neighborhood to use. So you, you need to pay attention to your consumption, look at your winter, winter versus summer months, and to size a system that will allow you not to produce more than you can consume on average across the year, considering this 12 month moving window through which you can transfer your over overproduction from month to month. And last but not least, how does this all happen? Essentially, there are some permits that are required, including building permits and electrical permits. Uh, for the most part, when you reach out to the solar community at large and you talk to companies that do the system design and installation, they, for the most part, handle what's called the, the sort of project management details, which include getting the building permit. Um, it includes having an electrician involved, whether it be subcontracted or someone who's on staff who will get your electrical permits. But what you might want to do ahead of time on your own is to contact your utility company and request, essentially you're gonna ask for a connection, a connection app, you're gonna apply for a connection agreement. And what the utility company will need to do, especially if your system is larger, like Heather's system, uh, if you're around the 10 kilowatt size and you're in a rural area, maybe what are called grid constraints. And what this means is that the local infrastructure from transformers to the trans stations in the area may not be able to accommodate your system producing electricity in the fashion that renewable energy does in terms of the uh, cyclical in the day during the night. Also what happens is that there may be other systems already connected and the utility company has an idea of how much generation they want to accommodate in some of these older infrastructure areas coming from renewable sources. And last but not least, you're going to have a net metering, <clears throat> sorry, a net metering agreement. And this is the agreement through which the utility company agrees to honor your generation and reduce your consumption bill by the amount that you generate and to carry over your excess month over month for the 12 month roving window to offset your consumption costs. Do we have the same? Oh, yeah, we did this slide already. Oh, yeah, I don't know how it got there twice. Oh, wait, wait, there's one other one. 
Oh yeah, last but not least, operation and maintenance. What's really nice about the solar system, aside from the inverter replacement, which right now, based on manufacturer's warranties on the inverters, um, this is kind of the really only kind of cost expense that will happen within the 12 to 15 year period. Uh, as long as you put in, and this is the important aspect, you need to put in some kind of critter guard. And they come in all sizes and shapes, ranging from a kind of crude fence-like material to a wonderful extruded aluminum with an adhesive tape that sticks around the edges like a skirting. But it is very, very important. I made the mistake in a hurry of putting up my system back in 2012 without this. And slowly but surely, I monitored squirrels chewing through wires and noticed various things not working anymore. And this is the other really neat thing is most of the inverters come with an online performance monitoring system, which allows you to put alerts to yourself to make your, you aware of when there are issues with the system's performance. And also to sort of see whether or not you're kind of meeting your expectations in terms of your performance and your consumption and perhaps even encourage you to consume less on the months when you're producing less. And the cleaning, I think I mentioned earlier, to me, it's like a fine balance between, is it safe to do so versus how much am I consuming? So for myself, what I found is in the winter, um, there was one part of my house where the roof pitch is very shallow. It's probably like 10 or 15 degrees, but it's very difficult for me to get up there in the snow. And I found that in the winter months, those eight panels weren't producing all that much. And so I chose not to attempt to clear off the snow. So it's really going to be on a, your own decision. But bear in mind, safety is always trumps everything else. And so in a nutshell, that's, that's pretty much what it takes. Um, and the cool part might have been a little bit balking at the cost early on. And so now my test is going to explain what is in place right now, thanks to our federal government and the Canadian, the Canada Greener Homes Program to help offset some of the costs. Without further ado. Awesome. Thank you, Ruth. Um, we actually, before we get to that, there are some questions in the chat that I would like to address first, if that's okay. okay. Um, so the first question here is I have a 25 year old steel roof. How easy is it to mount panels? You know what? There are systems available. Uh, the main challenge with the steel roofs is that they get quite hot and they are slippery. But there are systems that are good for standing seam. It depends. I, I, don't, I need to know more details on the, on the roof itself. But if it's like a standing seam metal roof like they have on typical barns, there are the, the mounting feet designed for these systems. As you can imagine, there are configurations to cover all configurations of roofing. Uh, the main challenge is ideally you'd like to find an installer that has some experience with doing work on metal roofs because they are more prone to becoming dented and, and damaged. And so the installer needs to have some experience and to have some expertise in using that kind of mounting configuration and those kinds of racking systems. But for sure, this is an ideal roof because you will not have to worry about redoing your roof in the future. And it will be, the, the, the it's the optimal scenario, actually. Awesome, thank you for that. And uh, another question here is, how do you protect the batteries in the winter on a seasonal property? Ah, well, it depends, you know, what's interesting, I'm glad that you brought up batteries and winter, because one thing I didn't have an opportunity to talk about when we were talking briefly about batteries is that, and depending on the size of your battery system, there are several things that need to be considered. Is that batteries, they all types of batteries do they need to be in a place where they can vent because they will they off gas to some extent and they need to be able to be in a climate controlled area. Even more so, the lithium batteries cannot be allowed to freeze. Uh, the, the ones that are not lithium. They prefer not to be below zero because their capacity and their ability to be charged and discharged is very adversely affected um, in, in a kind of catastrophic, well, catastrophic. It's for every degree Celsius, the degradation requires you to make a larger system. So at the end of the day, your best bet is to have a power shed. This is a separate structure 
that's insulated and perhaps even heated, especially for the lithium ion batteries, to store your charge controllers, your batteries, your power conditioner, your inverter, all of this equipment in its own um, enclosed area where you can control the, the temperature and protect all this equipment from the elements. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and the next question here for Mike is, do you have any experience with thin film solar? Yeah. It's interesting that you asked that because back in, I'm going to say 2009-10, when the feed-in tariff program first started, what was interesting about the thin film is there were a bunch of manufacturers that kind of came out with, you know, the suitcase and check it out, look what I have. And people were quite hesitant because the challenge was with the thin film is that for the same amount of square feet, they were like, I think I, if you remember, I was talking about somewhere between 20 and 23% efficiency. And so this is like converting the solar watts into electricity. This is the panels that we can raise off the roof. The thin film is coming in at like 12% to 15%. So if we're fighting for real estate, uh, the, the thin film just couldn't compete if I can produce so much more. But thin film did have, does have its role in sort of smaller systems. If you want to, you know, charge your laptop and your phone and you've got, you know, your RV on the roof of your RV on the dash of your car and in mobile applications attached to your backpack, there's a whole lot of interesting applications, but right now it just can't compete from an efficiency perspective. And when I say efficiency, I just mean how much electricity per square foot you can generate. It, it's it's not efficient enough to be the best use of space. And so at this point in time, it's not advised for rooftop insulation. The other challenge with thin film is it's very difficult to dissipate heat. And the solar, the way the solar cells and that technology works is that for every degree Celsius in excess of sort of standard atmospheric conditions, you have degradation in voltage differential that's produced. And the thin film is unable to dissipate heat from its bottom surface, obviously, because of how it's mounted. But I have great hopes, and I see that the solar, solar shingle people are, are attempting to introduce these products because they, they, they're, they're more seamlessly integrated into what we're used to seeing in a roof. So from an aesthetic perspective, I can see how people would prefer them. Great, so is this uh, solar film like something that you can just stick on the window? and that can gener generate electricity? Or um, I, I think this next question here is, you know, what is the future in the next two to five years? What can we expect for the technology to do for us? You know what, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know for sure. They, you know, from a electrochemical perspective, they're looking at different, I think the term is doping, where they're looking at, how different elements can be introduced into silicone. They're looking at, gra I think, graphene and other elements all together to, to use as these for semiconductors. And there's this just recently, and I've forgotten the term, and I'm so sorry, I should have done my homework on this. I didn't think I'd get such in-depth uh, technical questions in the future. But yes, there, there's, and I think it's MIT, one of the, one of the big schools. Is, is looking at sort of like huge game changers in the world of solar, right down at the cell level, how we're looking at how that electrochemical reaction happens. And I think that at this point, what we've got with the thin film and, and the solar modules and the cells, we're making very small incremental improvements, you know, from 18% to 20% efficiency. But I think the next step, which hopefully will happen, in the next five years will be a huge game changer and will change kind of how we even envision. But that said, I don't want to discourage anyone from adopting the current technology because adopting the current technology allows these manufacturers to further explore, to have R&D, to employ people. You know, this is how we make incremental improvements which become game changing is if we support current technology to enable future innovation. 
So I don't see any other questions in the chat right now, uh, but I will answer them or, or I'll uh, ask Ruth to answer them as we go along here. Um, so for the next little bit, what I'll do is talk about home energy evaluations and what they are. Uh, so of course, here at Green Venture, we staff um, registered energy advisors that perform an EnerGuide home evaluation. And they're really used to understand how your home uses energy. So it is a full basement to attic evaluation of your home, um, starting from the exterior envelope, measuring windows uh, with low E detectors, doors, and any cracks in the envelope, and then moving into measuring all the mechanical equipment, uh, collecting data on insulation, um, as well as using a blower door test, which I will get into next. Um, and once you do an EnerGuide evaluation, you get an EnerGuide rating and label. You'll also get a renovations report, which will show you what the improvements uh, will do to the energy consumption of your house and how that can, how each improvement can lower the consumption. It also has a renewable aspect to it, so there is uh, room for solar energy to uh, um, you know, to impact your evaluation or your label. Um, and it shows you the potential of, of uh, the generation that you could have at your house. Um, so moving on to the blower door test, this is uh, a, a test that is done to your home and it is strapped onto your front door. It basically is a big fan that depressurizes the home. It'll suck the air out and let air slowly seep back in. Um, the energy advisor will input all the numbers into the HOT 2000 software, which translates the total number of cracks in the building into a sizable amount. So if you have, um, a, a very leaky house, an energy leaky house, you'll be able to see what sort of hypothetical hole would be if you added all up uh, the cracks, if you added all the cracks up together uh, from your house. So really showing you how air leaks in and out of that building. Um, and this is important because we want to see what energy is wasted, uh, where it's being wasted, and, you know, at the end of the day, save you uh, by making these improvements that are only found through uh, a test like this. Uh, so moving on to the Greener Homes Grant, uh, this is uh, essentially everything it covers, um, specifically today talking about the resiliency measures, which are uh, batteries for solar uh, panels, and that is up to $1,000, um, which will also have to be combined with another energy efficiency measure, that being air sealing, draft proofing, insulation. Um, or any of the other measures here. And then there is a $5,000 uh, rebate available for solar panels um, uh, in general. And I can post more specific uh, eligibility requirements for these rebates um, in a follow-up email where, where I can send this presentation out to as well. Um, and noting that it, for installing solar panels, the capacity of them have to be over than one kilowatt for you to get $1,000 and incrementally increasing per kilowatt. So that is what we had planned today. Um, I will check the chat here to see if there are any questions. I will hand it over to you, 